Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Orr of the Orr Group, and I welcome you all to uh, a continuing part of our Orr Group Talks series. Uh, today, we'll be discussing philanthropy with the head of one of the great American families uh, who has signed the Giving Pledge and who is a lifelong committed philanthropist. So I'm joined by Richard Marriott. Dick, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be with you. We really appreciate it. Your background is clear, clear that you're in Utah, but I'm guessing the real picture looks a little different today. Well, it's, uh, it's, that is the Wasatch Crest Trail that runs along the ridge line behind Park City Mountain Resort. One of my favorite uh, mountain bike trails. And this was taken in October. So it doesn't look like that right now, but it is, uh, has great memory. So I just leave it up there for a little inspiration. Love Utah, envious. <clears throat> so uh, I want to remind everybody that as with every Zoom call, you have the opportunity to post questions um, and you're either in the chat function or in the question uh, Q&A function. We're happy to uh, answer questions as you see, as you post them. Uh, we'll try to fit them in. And with that, let's just get going. Uh, Dick, I'd like to start, if I may, with a couple of personal questions. Um, just to ground everybody, Dick was born in 1939. And Dick, as I understand it, you grew up in the DC area. Is that correct? Yes, I was born in Washington, DC at the uh, Washington Women's Hospital, I guess. It's right next to where George Washington University is right now. Exactly. It no longer exist. It's now a <laughs> condominium, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> uh, you were an undergrad, graduated from University of Utah in 1963. And then went on to that great institution, Harvard Business School, got your MBA in 1965. So actually my first question is, I, as I said before we got on live, uh, I also went to University of Utah for one semester so I could ski every day, which was fantastic. And understanding the environment there, and, and you're from Utah, your family's of course related to Utah in every way. But when you went to HBS, wasn't that a little intimidating? Well, not really. I. I enjoyed my years at the University of Utah because I skied every day. <laughs> and I figured I better get some education. So I signed up for Harvard Business School. And in those days, it wasn't so hard to get into, I guess. But, uh, but I enjoyed Harvard. We have a, a summer home in New Hampshire, just 100 miles uh, north of Harvard. And so I've been going up there since I was four years old. So I was very familiar with Boston, very familiar with the area, and I thoroughly enjoyed my two years at Harvard. Well, it was a good move, and I, I don't believe you that it was, was not hard to get in at that time. I'll bet it was. And um, so congratulations on that. Now, you had the wisdom to marry Nancy, and as I read about her, I, I was aware that she was an artist in several respects. I was unaware of her accomplishment as a lyric soprano and her many, many uh, tremendous performances uh, all over the country and all the world, it's really uh, terrific. I hope she's listening. And if so, Nancy, congratulations on all of that. And then to continue that, I saw that you have four daughters, 13 grandkids and three great grandkids. That wow. is, oh, five. Okay, so this info is a little old. <laughs> Next couple of months, it'll be six. You know, they're starting sure. to come along. Congratulations, what, a, what an accomplishment. Uh, I know you're an avid biker and we talked a lot about skiing. Uh, you, you are definitely a skier. And the other thing that I think defines you, it seems as I look at all the written material and I, I've gotten to know you personally, is that you are a devout Mormon. And in your giving pledge letter to Bill Gates, I was reading that you and Nancy uh, said uh, that you were blessed to, and I quote, be members of a church that teaches us the importance of personal virtue and the value of active participation in both leadership and supportive roles, end quote. So my question is, how influential has your faith been to you in business and in philanthropy and in family? Well, I think faith is the key word. You know, we've got to trust in what's going to happen to us in the next life. I mean, why are we here upon the earth? That's always the big question. What am I doing here? And, you know, I think we're here to make a living, obviously, raise a family. But we're here to help other people and serve other people. And, uh, and the church really, really uh, impresses that upon the youth of the church. 
you know, uh, BYU, for instance, which I did not go to, I went to the University of Utah, but with their motto is come here to learn, go forth to serve, you know, and uh, most of the young men and a lot of the young women now to serve two-year missions. And what we do, we go around and we talk to people and we try and give them, you know, specifically, we want to introduce them to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but we also want to help them. We want to be friends. And uh, if they need to have needs or something, we try and help them out. And uh, this, this uh, the missionary system, I think, is the most fabulous system on, the, on earth for educating young men and women and getting them out of the teenage years and getting them thinking about why am I here on earth? And what mission can I fulfill in my day-to-day -day relationships with other people? So the church has just done an incredible job with that. And, you know, the leader of our church, who is my inspiration, is 96 years old. I was skiing with him every year up until he was 92 years old. Uh, there you go. I mean, he is a world-renowned thoracic surgeon. Uh, he was on the team that developed the heart-lung machine. I mean, and he is amazing. He looks like he's 60 years old. He's got a photographic memory. And, you know, he's running this huge organization at that age. And uh, I said, you know, who, 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 what examples have you got in your life? You know, you'd like to emulate? He's one of them. My father's another. He was an incredible guy, you know, and uh, so. And so let me, let me talk about your dad and your parents for a minute, because as we get into your professional uh, world, um, everyone knows of Marriott's, obviously. So it was Jay Willard and Alice Marriott who actually founded this place called the Hot Shop, which uh, I had not been familiar with that name, but that was in 1927. And I heard that you worked there at one time, good for you. And uh, the Marriott early philosophies I read, and I know it now uh, from a lot of experience, good food, good service at a fair price. And uh, Dick, for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dick, you and I have worked together. I, I just counted up for 20 years. You are War Group's longest standing partner. So uh, I have learned in my own work with the Marriott groups, all the different groups, that you are, in fact, a fair trader. You are a wonderful partner. And uh, that's the only reason I think we're both working together still. It's a terrific organization that your parents and now you and your brother built. So when, just to go on and complete the story, I found that you built or your family built the first drive-in on the East Coast. Um, you diversified into airline food services, a lot of other things. And then I guess through Bill's leadership, Bill Marriott, your brother, uh, in 1957 moved into hotels. And then by 1998, you had 500 hotels in the Marriott uh, Empire. And then through the Starwood acquisition in 2016, um, it grew to 5,700 properties, the largest hotel company in the world. And then on top of all that, Dick, you personally have run the host hotels and resorts since 1993. Uh, that is the largest lodging REIT, R-E-I-T, in the world. And you're still chair of that, as I understand it. And, mm -hmm. you, and, and through that time, you were executive vice president also at the Marriott International. You're the chair of First Media chair of the JW and Alice Marriott Foundation and chair of Bridges, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But that is an amazing uh, family story. Uh, it's a, it's congratulations on everything that you and Bill and your, uh, your parents and your whole family have accomplished. So that brings me to uh, being involved somewhat with family business myself, nothing like at your scale, but I'm wondering how hard is that or what's it like to grow up in an environment like that where your whole family is driven towards excellence and to international growth and all of that? Well, when I grew up, my family wasn't oriented to international growth. <laughs> my father got to Mexico a couple of times <laughs> on a few hunting trips, but that was about it. And, uh, you know, in the early days of the business, our business was restaurant business, period. We had no hotels in the business for the first 30 years. And, uh, and I grew up visiting restaurants with my father. And uh, my father was an, a perfectionist. He had a whole manual about one inch thick. on Every employee had to read this manual and apply all the rules in the manual. 
uh, how long your fingernails would be, how short their hair would be, the girls, what color lipstick they could wear. I mean, it was unbelievable. Today, they'd probably sue him for it. <laughs> but uh, in the old days, he had everything programmed and he was seeking perfection. And, you know, if you seek perfection along the way, you've got ex excellence, I guess. And he got excellence. He had fabulous operations. And these hot shops started with an A&W root beer stand, a nine seat A&W root beer. Nine stand. seats, yep. Opened up the day Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. And he always told Lindbergh, he says, we all got in business the same day, but you got all the, all the marketing and all the, all the credit. Nobody paid any attention to me and my little nine seat root beer stand. And that, uh, you know, the winter came in, in October of 1927 and got cold and people didn't want an ice cold root beer in a frosty mug. And so he said, well, he went, my mom, who had majored in French and Spanish at the University of Utah and spoke Spanish, she went next door to the Mexican embassy and she asked the chef there, he said, got any good recipes I can use? And my, my friends are saying we ought to have Mexican food in this little store. And he gave her his uh, recipe for hot tamales and chili and even ordered the hot tamale uh, wrappings from uh, Texas. And so she started cooking up hot tamales and chili in their apartment. I'm not sure the local folks enjoyed that, but, uh, but he would carry it down to this new place and he called it a hot shop because now they had something hot. That was his marketing ploy for the- There actually is someone asking you a question, Dick. My grandmother took me to the hot shops and I loved it. What happened to it? And I know you went public in 53. Is that what happened to the name hot shops? Yeah, well, the the company was called Hot Shops up until the hotels came around. Okay. And, and that was for 30 years. And when they went public in 1953, uh, yeah, that that was the business. And uh, it was, a, they had about 60 Hot Shops at one time. Wow. And they started making acquisitions. They bought Bob's Big Boy and Geno's and, and uh, Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor restaurants. And uh, we had about a thousand restaurants at one time. And, uh, and so the restaurants were really the major part of the business up until the, uh, 1957 when the first hotel came along. And my brother became manager of the first hotel and my father didn't want to put him in there. He said, you don't know anything about this business. My brother said, neither do you or is anybody else working for us now? And uh, so he took over the hotel and he got, you know, he was very aggressive in his growth. and. Uh, and now it is all hotels. Uh, the last hot shop, I think, closed up around 1995 or 1998. It was a cafeteria over in Marlow Heights, Maryland. But, uh, you know, they eventually all the leases ran out and we decided we would move over to hotels. It's a lot easier to run. One hotel is doing several million dollars a year than it is 10 restaurants doing <laughs> right. half a million dollars each a year. So. Uh, so, Dick, are you are you glad are you glad you all you stuck with the family business all through your career? And, and oh, one yeah. question I've got to ask: Have you ever had a disagreement with your brother? No. Well, I had lots of disagreements when I was a teenager. <laughs> when I was he's seven years older than I was, uh, and I drove him crazy when we were little kids. But then he went off to school, and uh, well, we've really never had an argument since. And he's been really my only boss since and uh, you know i've gone i have had multiple jobs in marriott and uh, he called me up and said hey we got a problem with architecture construction why don't you go over and take over that thing and, and figure it out and i did that and I had for four or five years and i ran the franchising for roy rogers i ran the theme parks i ran the, the systems department <laughs> he says well you know how to work a computer go and take over the systems department <laughs> I worked in hotel development. I worked in just about every part of the company. And it was a fabulous opportunity for me. I loved it. That's great. What, what, a, what, a, what a story, though. Congratulations. And to watch what you and Arnie Sorensen have done uh, through this pandemic with, you know, a lodging, the largest lodging system in the world is nothing less than phenomenal. And so congratulations on that. And um, I think you're going to be doing great things in the, in the you know, as, as we get out of this thing as well. So I'm a regular stayer uh, at your, uh, your proud facilities all over the world, so. Well, Arnie Sorensen has done an outstanding job. 
I mean, amazing. he's had his own trials. I know. You know pancreatic cancer and everything. Yep. I mean, it, I mean, he has been an inspiration to everybody in the company. You know, my dad's mantra was uh, take care of your employees and they will take care of the customers, you know. And Arnie's got, you know, even when you're laying off thousands of the people, I mean, yep. our hotels are closed or doing 10% occupancy, you can't keep everybody on the staff. But he has done it with style and grace and they all know how he feels about it and how our family feels about it. Well, truly an outstanding story. So let's move into philanthropy now because this, you know, the success that you and your family have achieved uh, through your business ventures have enabled you to do a lot of really great things uh, charitably. So let me just start by saying, I know you signed the giving pledge in 2013, and that was pretty early in the, uh, in the process of Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, uh, you know, talking and promoting this thing. Why did you as a family, you and Nancy, decide to commit 50% of your family's wealth uh, by the time that you would pass to charity? What was the motivation and how do you feel about that? Well, the motivation started by my wife going to a friend's house, Roger Sant, yeah, I know. Uh, he was a good friend of Bill Gates, and they had a little fireside, and Bill was there, and Nancy was there, and she came home to me and says, hey, they're starting this thing called the Pledge. Should we get involved with that? <laughs> I said, hey, I plan on giving everything away anyway. Uh, <laughs> it was not a big sacrifice to sign the Pledge Agreement, and uh, so, you know, we've got our own family foundations. We've got the Mary Foundation, and, you know, my when I die and everything goes to Nancy and she passes on, everything's going to go into the foundation. So, you know, it's all going to philanthropy one way or another. So being with the pledge is, has been terrific. Great people involved with the pledge and we've learned a lot from it. So my observation is, and one of the things we love to focus on in these various webinars that we're doing is something we call mega philanthropy. And you are a mega philanthropist meaning that you have the ability and do, you know, make very large contributions to many, many organizations. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues set the list of uh, the, the dozens of charities that you've been very generous to. So um, it's just fascinating. Do you view yourself as a mega philanthropist with a responsibility or is it something you've earned the right to do? What, how do you feel about it personally? You and Nancy, when you sit and you talk about this, who are you gonna to give to? How does that happen? Well, we are not a mega philanthropist. Bill Gates is a mega philanthropist. <laughs> Warren Buffett is a mega philanthropist. We're just the little guys down below, but we're trying to- I don't believe it. Not, listen, for anyone listening, don't believe that, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> but I, we just feel, you know, when you're giving much, much is expected. And, uh, and we have been in the hospitality business all our lives. And the hospitality business depends on the local folks in your community. And it's a very important element of the community. And we just, we've always felt very strongly that we meant to support our communities. And the focus of our foundation is basically to support the Washington DC area and their schools and early childhood development and, and other situations there. And to help the schools that we've all gone to and have helped us and the hospitals and so forth that have helped us, kept us healthy. So, you know, we're, you know, we have a broad range of things, but we're really concentrated on medical, uh, educational and community. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got quite a bit of money, but compared to the mega philanthropists, we are not in that league. <laughs> well, how are you doing against your pledge to commit you know, 50% of your wealth by the time of your passing. Is that something you want to achieve in your lifetime or are you going to give it, in, you know, in gifts? Uh, in, in we're giving as much as we can give legally. <laughs> and uh, yes, we, we're doing just fine, you know, but being a philanthropist, it's, it's another business, you know, you've got to figure out who you, you got to have your goals, you got to have your miles, milestones, you got to know you got to have good staff that can get in and figure out who do you who who is the best person to support. You know there are what thousands of over a million charitable organizations in the country, and every city's got hundreds, if not thousands, of them. Um, which ones do you get? And how do you how do you get to the most people? And you know we I have personally concentrated a lot on early childhood development. Um, 
you know, one of the biggest problems we've got in this country is the fact that an awful lot of kids uh, graduate from high school and they can't even read, and uh, especially in Washington, D.C. And uh, they say if a child can't read at the third grade level in the third grade, they're probably not going to graduate from high school. And, and they're probably never going to have a full-time job that's meaningful. I mean, so my thought is don't try to solve the problem, solve the cause of the problem. And there are so many young men and women who are born into families with no father in the home, no education by the mother, no books in the home. They never learn to read. They sit and watch television all day. And then when they get to school, they still don't know how to read. And I mean, if you, you can impact that in some way, I think you're making an important difference. And uh, so that's been one of my priorities. Dick, when you and Nancy make the decisions uh, along your own priorities, do you make it your business to involve the whole family in these decisions? Or is it you and Nancy who pretty much every year sit down and or over the course of the year sit and <clears throat> make these decisions? Nancy has her own foundation. I have my own foundation. Okay. And my daughters, we created a foundation for them several years ago. I see. So, and it, uh, they all work together on it. <clears throat> and they... It has been fabulous, actually. Uh, so, because they all live in different places. Nobody lives in Washington, D.C. And they're in California and Wisconsin and Massachusetts and Utah. <clears throat> and so they go out and they find foundations in their local areas to give to. And it has been a blessing to them and the family. It's forced them to work together. They all love each other. We're unique in the fact that all my kids get along. They truly love each other and they love working with each other. And the foundations facilitated that. So they really cover their own areas. And uh, Nancy and I, Nancy, as you said, is a very professional and extraordinary singer. And she is really into celebrating and supporting the arts and, and universities and uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, and, and it has brought a lot of happiness into our lives. And I support you know, hospitality. I support <clears throat> the local schools, the uh, homeless centers and so forth in Washington, DC and try to really uh, put my goal in supporting the local community. Dick, I know a question that the people listening always want to know, <laughs> as do I, I'm a fundraiser you know, by practice. And I'm always wondering, what does a person like you uh, imagine a person like me or those of us who are on the call who need those dollars to run our nonprofit organizations, you know, what's the best approach to a person like you? How, how should we think about, you know, asking you for a gift? Well, you need to know what I enjoy giving to and what my interests are. I'm interested in the hospitality business. I'm interested in education. Uh, don't call me up and ask me for uh, money for some concert down in, in the inner city. I'm not interested. My wife is interested in that. She would love to talk to somebody about that. I don't, <laughs> I'm really interested in the things that affect people who are in need. And do you have a staff that, you know, does the research and <clears throat> all of that? Or do you just, are, you're talking to people at cocktail parties and, no. uh, you know, you learn about it that way? I have a very competent staff, five people uh, who are out in the community and they check out all the areas that they think we ought to get to and they make recommendations to me. They take all the requests. Nobody's calling me up and saying, hey Dick, I need $100,000 for this project. I just refer them to the staff. And, uh, and then when they decide, then we all sit down and talk about it. We might go out and visit. <clears throat> they all make visits. They, they are on the ground. And uh, it, it's just, it's like investing in any company. You know, you got to find out what they're doing, why they're doing it, what kind of management they have, uh, what kind of results they've had. I mean, we give some, um, a major gift of something. We want to report back. How do you use that money? What are the results? And, uh, you know, if we get good reports and good results, We'll keep giving to them and increase our, our contribution. So it's just common sense running a good operation. So 
the Marriott name is so re well regarded and so well known, you know, internationally. Is it important when you make a very large, like a, you know, to a capital campaign, a very large gift or to a school? Because I know you, you have the, like at Bolus, you have the Marriott Library, for example. Is it important to put the Marriott name on things? Uh, is that an important part of your philanthropy? It's not an important part for us, except in hospitality schools. We like to have the Marriott name on these hospitality schools because we need recruits. And we want these great young men and women who are graduating from these hospitality schools. And they say they've gone into the Marriott Library or the Marriott Cafeteria, or the Marriott. Den. At least they got Marriott on top of mind. And it helps us, helps Marriott in recruiting these great people. As far as the family is concerned, I don't care whether our name is on it or not. But the schools and the other people like to put our name on it because it shows that our family's behind it. And so why shouldn't you be behind it? <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, I have no ambition to get my name on anything, but, uh, but it's on 7,600 hotels. So <laughs> I guess I've lost that battle. So my research was wrong. I thought it was 5,700, but well, that, it was a couple of years ago. <laughs> a couple of years ago. <laughs> oh, it's uh, doubled almost at that time. No, that's amazing. Um, so I was going to ask you about cash versus planned gifts. A lot of us in the fundraising area, you know, think that planned giving is such a powerful tool because it enables uh, any donor, you know, not to part with cash today, but to be sure that, you know, by the, when they pass away in their will, that either through a bequest or any number of, you know, financial tools, that um, you know, money could be left to uh, some favorite charities. Is that something you ascribe to or what, well, what you know, as I'm in my 80s, I'm starting to think about it, <laughs> but I have not subscribed to it as yet. You know, we're, we're giving the maximum amount our foundations can give every year, and I've made a lot of cash gifts this past year. <clears throat> but uh, normally, we just give our, you know, required amount, and if I see something come up or another need that we have, and I'd be happy to give a cash gift. But I haven't put anything in my will. Yeah, <laughs> and I know another thing that um, that a lot of philanthropists believe is that if they're going to, you know, make a significant contribution to a charitable organization, they like to play a role on the board. So, how many boards of directors do you sit on? Not necessarily the chair, but do you sit on of charitable organizations? Do you feel that's an important connection when you're making a significant gift? I do not want to be on any more boards. <laughs> If that were a requirement, I would withdraw my contribution. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but right, uh, you know, I'm, on the, boards. <laughs> I'm on the National Advisory Council at, at, at BYU and other places where we've given uh, substantial contributions. But I have no desire to be on any boards. In fact, I've gotten off most of my corporate boards except for host hotels and resorts and our, our uh, communication company and so forth. But, yeah. Well, when you're when you're hanging out in a place like Utah, why wouldn't you do that? I yeah, agree. Right. Well, now All right, you, so, can, you can be on the board and be out here now. They're a virtual <laughs> society. So that is a superb segue and actually addresses one of the questions that someone's posted, which says, do you does your foundation support restaurant and hotel workers specifically? And Dick, what I've worked with you on for 20 years is uh, Bridges, uh, a charitable organization called Bridges from School to Work, which was founded by the Marriott family, but now is an independent organization. Um, and it is nothing less than phenomenal. But Dick, what, what is the mission of Bridges and why were you and your family so interested in, in uh, founding this? Well, my brother and I, got together back in 1989. That's 31 years ago, 32 years ago now. And uh, we had the Marriott Foundation. My father had passed away in 1985 and we set up this foundation. And we sat down and said, what can we give to where we can actually have an impact? I mean, global warming wasn't a deal then. <laughs> I mean, are we gonna solve cancer? Are we gonna get rid of malaria? Are we gonna, you know, what are we gonna do? And we looked at our company. Our company is a hospitality company. It's probably the most labor intensive industry in the world. And one of our biggest problems is finding good hourly workers. 
and uh, and we looked, and we had a lot of young men and women with disabilities working at Marriott. And as a result, we said, why don't we try to find jobs for these young men with disabilities and teach other companies to do the same? And, uh, and so we said we formed what was called Bridges from School to Work. Uh, the purpose was to work with special education in, uh, hospital, uh, in uh, all the high schools, and we're now in 12 different cities. But well, work with the special education kids, uh, find out the ones that really wanted to work. And, uh, and we have, you know, we have emotional disabilities, physical disabilities, psychotic, psychological disabilities, uh, all kinds of you know, autism and everything else. These kids are graduating, 400,000 of them are graduating every year from special education and well less than 50% of them will ever get a full-time job. And uh, I mean, that's a huge block of labor out there. Most of them want jobs and we found out when we get them jobs, they do well in them. It's just finding the spot for them, finding something that they can do and, uh, and, and achieve something. And it gives them, we can say, we want to transform, <clears throat> transform lives through the power of a job. And we are transforming their lives. You know, <clears throat> all these studies have been done on, on happiness. You know, what makes people happy? Well, what, what really pushes your button and makes you feel good? And all of them come down, you know, family, friends, home, having enough food. But the real thing that makes them all happy is a job. And if they have a job, they can feel fulfilled. They can feel like they're making a contribution. And, uh, and it just has, has been sensational. We have put well over 20,000 young men and women in full-time jobs and with over 5,000 companies. <clears throat> and we're seeing when we go to a company and then, uh, what we do, we have employer representatives. And uh, each employer representative has responsibility for two or three schools. And <clears throat> They work with the, uh, the uh, special education group to identify these kids. And then when we identify the kids and we work with them, they work with them personally. It is not just send them for them and have them fill things out. They sit down with them, they coach them on how to dress, how to make a presentation, how do you apply for a job? And then they help them apply for a job. Now you'd think that doesn't take too much, but in this digital age, applying for a job is a very technical operation. And there are all kinds of blocks on uh, human resource sites. And if somebody hasn't had a job before, that moves them down. If they've got some kind of a disability, that usually kicks them out. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we go and we get actually help them do the application for the job. And then we coach them on their presentation for their in-person interview. And, and then if they get the job, we'll go with them to the job and make sure that they've got the proper facilities. And 80% of the kids we work with get jobs. And I mean, not 80% of the non-disabled group get jobs. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we have just been very gratified by the success of this program. And, you know, I've got, you know, uh, my favorite story is about a guy named Sanford Jones. Uh, he lives in Chicago. He had autism. <clears throat> he liked trains. So his mother would take him on the trains all day. And they'd go up and down all the stops at, uh, in the, on the Chicago Transit Authority. And he would memorize all the stops and all the stations. But that's all he wanted to do. He just wanted to ride in trains. I mean, his mom signed him up for bridges. And the bridges uh, employer representative said, yeah, I saw this advertisement for a job with the Chicago Transit Authority on talking to people who are calling in and are lost and they don't know what train stop to go to or what, what station to be on or where they're going. He said, you ought to apply for this job. Well, he went out and he applied for the job. He, <laughs> he was handling over 200 calls a week, <clears throat> which was three times what anybody else would call or be able to take care of because he never had to look anything up. He could, they would say, well, I'm down at the, at the this street here and I need to get up to the street here. He used to say, well, you just take train number six or to stop number seven and never looked anything up, had it all in his brain. And they even, he even got a story on the front page of the Chicago Tribune 
call him the train man. <laughs> he was unbelievable, but I mean, a perfect example of finding out what kind of a talent have you got? What can you do? And then finding the job that you can excel in. And, you know, he had full-time work for many years with the Chicago Transit Authority. And he was one of their best employees. So, you know, everybody has got something they can do. And our job is finding out what it is and then getting them a job where they can do it. I think the organization is truly amazing. You're in 12 cities now and, you know, uh, helping, you know, more than 25,000 kids is really outstanding. And it's a, it's a, it's a really sweet and wonderful uh, group that you're helping. I've met a lot of them through the event activity that we've done. In fact, uh, someone today sent me a book <clears throat> which highlighted, you know, many of the success stories and there were dozens of them. <laughs> yeah. the, story, the stories are amazing. And, and every, every year at your event, you highlight, you know, and honor uh, one or two uh, folks. And it's really, really great. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me is this year with, you know, so much focus on diversity. I mean, it's not like we haven't focused on diversity, right? But this year with it being, you know, so front and center in America and elsewhere, um, I always talk to uh, Tad Asbury, your, your wonderful executive director, Tad, I hope you're watching today. Uh, but, you know, about the wonderful work that you've done for so many years with communities, you know, that really of a diverse nature that, that need help uh, getting to the workplace. And so you, you know, you're one of the folks that have really been doing this for all these years. Uh, so I applaud you. We applaud you. We support you. Uh, it's it's really terrific. A question, Dick, that somebody's posting here, which is really interesting too. The other big issue, obviously, this year has been COVID. It still is. We're trying to get the vaccine. It's still very much an issue. Um, how has your giving altered, if it has, uh, with the advent of COVID? Well, we made a special effort <coughs> to get out and give extra. <clears throat> to all these, <clears throat> excuse me, all these uh, organizations that are being really hurt by COVID. And so we've given a lot of extra uh, money, both in the Marriott Foundation and my foundation, the Daughters Foundation, trying to support these, uh, these charitable organizations that have really been hurt by the COVID uh, attack. So it has increased our giving. And getting back to Bridges, how has COVID impacted, I mean, with schools mostly being virtual and you do most of your work, all your work in schools, how has that impacted the way in which you've been able to impact the program? Well, it has been an educational experience for our people. For everyone. Uh, they, <laughs> they have found out that uh, they can get a lot more done and they can contact a lot more people. And we have webinars now where we have maybe a hundred of our our young people involved and training them and giving them tips on how to apply for jobs and where the jobs are. And it's made us much more efficient. You know, we've had to reduce our hours a little bit for our, uh, for our employer representatives, but we've kept them all and, uh, and they are all very productive. And they will still, you can still get into the schools. You have to pass a lot of digital blockades to get on their program, but you can do it. And we figured out how to do it so that we can still, you know, talk to the special education departments and all the people that are working there. And, you know, we're a lot more efficient. You know, we don't have to go down and walk, knock on their door and wait for a meeting and all that stuff. Now you can just contact them and, and make progress. And it's the same with hiring. You know, we've got a lot of, a lot, we deal, deal with almost 5,500 companies. And, um, and so we've got a lot of contacts out there too to really get these kids involved and they can, they can interview virtually. And then if they pass the virtual interview, then they can go in and interview in person. And, but it's worked out very good. We all adjust, don't we? <laughs> let's, we hope, adjust. let's hope we get back to some, uh, some normal. It's not all virtual one day. Um, and just to mention that you are still the chair of this board of directors for Bridges and uh, you do a wonderful job. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I don't know, is this your primary charitable focus in terms of organizationally, or um, is this just one of many? It's one of several. You know, I'm, I mean, I've got my own foundation and my wife's foundation, my daughter's foundation, the Marriott Foundation. I mean, I was on a two-hour meeting this morning with the Marriott Foundation. And so I'm, I'm doing as much as I can. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> and the virtual system has made it a lot easier. 
All right, well, Dick, I promised to let you go after uh, this time frame we're in now. Do you have any uh, issues you want to raise? Uh, we've got a good group of folks here who are listening in, and I know they're fascinated by everything you've been saying. Anything you want to add? No, these are unusual times. You know, and, uh, and there's no time in our history where it's been more important to have good communication and transparent communication. I mean, we've had some tragedies in the last few days, you know, which should never happen and hopefully will never happen again. And uh, so, you know, you know, our job is to do the best we can with what we got. You know, we think the good Lord's looking down on us. He says, are they trying? <laughs> are they really trying to do their best? And if they are, I think, you know, we'll get our eventual reward. But I know it makes us feel good to be able to help others and to be a positive, have a positive impact on our community. So we appreciate it. And we thank the ORAP group who have been, you're basically uh, doing a lot of our development work for the Bridges Foundation and doing a great job. And uh, we just love your folks. And, uh, you know, you know, our, again, our mantra is take care of your people and they will take care of the customers. And, you know, you, your folks have taken great care of us. We hopefully will take care of a lot of people out there in hotels when the business comes back, and it will. Well, I've been working with your colleague, Mark Donovan, for 20 years now. He keeps, <laughs> keeps that whip out. <laughs> but it's all good. So, Dick, thank you very, very much for joining us today. It's really inspirational uh, hearing and, and actually watching you in action uh, and the whole, actually the whole Marriott clan, uh, you guys are amazing, Tre tremendous success. And thank you for your leadership and charity. And thank you for the giving pledge. Uh, I think it's changing, uh, you know, with all the signers of that, it's really changing the way philanthropy is uh, able to grow and expand and deal with more and more issues and help more and more people. So thank you for that and um, best to Nancy. And with that, we will sign off. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, this is the Or Group Talks series and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on the next one. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.